Bet on it, NFL edition. I am Kelly Stewart at Kelly in Vegas, joined today by Joe Ranieri, Marco D'Angelo, and Teddy Covers of wagertalk.com. There's my guys. What did we learn week one? Do we have some barking dogs? Teddy, just the tip is here to stay. Of course, we're going to finish off with some best bets, but in the interim, we've got some prop picks, some gold, and of course, some TNA. Let's get right into it. Marco D'Angelo is up first at Marco in Vegas. Thursday night primetime game. Buffalo, two and a half point underdogs at Miami. Total 49. Well, Kelly, we know that these Thursday night games are always a disadvantage for the road team. You got to travel on a short week. But when it is a division game like this one, that's a break for the road team because you play this team twice a year. So game prepping is much easier for opponent that you play on a regular basis than trying to game plan and travel on a Thursday night. So that's one break that Buffalo catches right out of the gate. The second break they catch, uh, and this would be a disadvantage for Miami, the month of September when Miami plays home games, it's a big edge for them whenever they're playing teams that are in cooler climates like Buffalo because it is still hotter than hell in Miami in September. But this isn't a Sunday afternoon game where that sun is just beating down on you and uh, wearing you down in the second half. This is a Thursday night game, so they catch a break as far as the weather goes. Buffalo, history-wise, they've won eight of the last nine meetings between these two teams. But I'll be the first to tell you, I think that margin is uh, getting closer and closer. Buffalo, I feel, is on the decline. They're not as good as they've been in past years. And Miami's on the rise. This is a team that can make a serious bid to win the division. With all of that said, I don't think there's enough of a gap where I can look at uh, Miami and feel that they are going to win by a margin. So you might know where I'm going to kind of go with my play on Thursday night. So you're going to kind of get a bonus play because i got to do something with it. I like Buffalo on a teaser, Kelly. I'm going to tease them up over the touchdown because that is the way to go in this one. You've got the history of them dominating Miami, and you've got Miami that's still learning how to win and then win by a margin. I don't see them winning by double digits. So who are we going to hook it up with, Kelly? Well, I know you won't like this one, but it is the right one to do. I'm taking the New York Giants and teasing them up. I know the Giants couldn't look any worse on Sunday, but am I going to really expect Washington with that defense to totally shut down the Giants? And am I going to expect Washington with a rookie quarterback to win by two scores? No, and it's a low total. This is the uh, perfect uh, role model for the proper way to tease. We're taking Buffalo and the Giants as my two-team teaser for you, and this will be a client play. Ooh, sounds disgusting. That's my favorite kind of play, Marco. <laughs> Hold your nose. Remember when you used to have to walk? You used to have to wear a paper bag to walk to the window. Now there's no shame in placing those bets because you have a cell phone. I love to see it. Joe, we're going right over to you on Sunday night. Chicago plus seven pretty much on the Wager Talk odd screen at the Houston Texans total 46. Yeah, so one of these teams is a contender and one of them is a uh, pretender. I'll let you guys figure out which is which as we're going to have, what, the number two overall uh, pick versus the number one overall pick over the last couple of years doing battle here. And call me crazy, uh, but that was some showing by Caleb Williams. I mean, that was... Honestly, I'm pretty sure Marco, Teddy, and myself probably could have threw for more yards and looked better doing it than Caleb Williams did. 48% of his passes, 64 yards, 9 of 16. Yikes. Uh, he did look like a deer caught in the headlights. Now, the good news is, let's face it, uh, that defense and special teams, they travel. They'll be on the road in Houston here uh, I did not love the number opening up. I did see it at seven in some spots. It, it has come down. It was six and a half. Now we're starting to see six. So it is coming off that original open number. And I get it. Division rival in Indy, they only won by two. They did give up four sacks in that game there, which you got to think the Chicago defense has got to be salivating a little bit. 
getting after C.J. Stroud here. I don't love the spot for Houston coming off of that big division win at Indy here. Uh, I do trust the Chicago defense uh, and special teams. The defense will, will, will certainly travel in this spot here. Uh, Houston is the better team. Make no mistake about it. I tend to look at a total in this spot here, Cal. I did not love that number. I wasn't running to the window to lay a touchdown in any way, shape, or form. But I've seen the total come down from 46 to 45, 45 and a half. And I agree with that move. We're going to have another primetime game at night with two pretty darn good defenses and one really suspect offense. It's got under written all over it for me under written all over it i'm going to be sweating because i have a feeling they are going to be in at least one if not a few of my survivor pools monday night teddy finishing us off strong here atlanta plus six and a half at philadelphia 47 teddy this one's interesting the look ahead line was almost three points lower do you think we see a seven pop up or do you think the sharps are going to immediately buy that one back and hope for a middle I would not be surprised at all if we see sevens before kickoff in this game. Whether they'll hold is another question, but it's pretty clear, at least during the week, there's been one-sided action on this game. It's been Philly money, and no surprise. I mean, what does the betting public focus on? The betting public focuses on offense. I mean, you have Jalen Hurts and Saquon Barkley and A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith making plays on national TV last week and lighting up the scoreboard. And Atlanta, obviously, the way they go two for nine on third downs, 226 total yards, 4.5 yards per play, minus three turnovers. You know, Kirk Cousins, not pretty in his first start since last October. You know, 155 yards, two INTs. They only had 45 yards in the second half. They had a bad, uh, fumbled a bad snap. I mean, it was as ugly an offensive showing for Atlanta and as good an offensive showing for Philly as you'll ever see. Hence the support for Philadelphia. All that being said, let's talk about defenses for a minute and spots for a minute. Philly defense allowed 7.1 yards per play. Atlanta defense, yeah, they lost the game straight up. They also didn't give up a touchdown in that ball game and allowed only 4.1 yards per play. They were great against the pass, 5.3. They were great against the rush, 3.3. And again, we're talking about one team that got gashed repeatedly. The other team didn't give up a TD. And the team that got gashed is a team that's laying. We talk about Philly and their home field advantage. I got Eagles 2-6-1 and one against the spread. Their last nine home games. That dates back to 2022. They're coming off a road trip to Brazil on a bad turf field where everyone got hurt. <laughs> you know, it's not an optimal spot. Atlanta's got B. John Robinson, Drake London, Kyle Pitts, all five starting linemen returning. I think Kirk Cousins will be just fine with another week. And I like the Falcons' defense more than that of the Eagles. Give me the points with Atlanta. Ooh, that makes me a little uneasy about my other survivor pick I was considering using and going against primetime Kirk Cousins. We're going to kick these three out of here, and we're going to find our glasses. They're over here on the desk somewhere. We're a little discombobulated on this Wednesday, but we're ready to pick some winners. But first, we've got to get to some trends and angles with the stat daddy, Ralph Michaels. Man with the pen, Ralph Michaels. And I know you don't really wear those glasses. Where'd you find them at? Like Goodwill? Those are way too crooked to actually use uh, trends and angles here on Bet On It, where Ralph brings us all of the nerd charts, hence the glasses. You know, Kel, I'm getting old. There is some type small enough now that these are just reading glasses off the counter at, at Walgreens just to help me read some of that small type. So, yes. Um, you know, as I joked about in the college football segment, Kelly, the reason I am now doing the charts this way is number one for our viewers and number two for you, that we see all the teams that apply. So we're going to go through three NFL situations for today. The first one is just basic. Guys, I'm not looking for any wow numbers. I just want you to realize, and you know, I love listening to VR's gold and he talks about week two overreactions in college football and in the NFL. So let's simply take a look at how teams do in NFL game number two of the season after what they did in game one. So you see, this is the chart on the left. And you see, I have previously win home favorite, previously win home dog, 
previously win a win favorite win away dog and the bottom four are if you lost game one so kelly take a look at the top two if you played your season opener at home and you won the game you have gone 35 percent against the spread and 39 percent against the spread if you were a home dog or home favorite if you played game one on the road look what you've done in game two if you won the game as an away favorite you've gone 57.7 percent if you won as an away dog you've gone 51.7 percent if you lost as a home favorite you're 48 percent if you lost as a home dog you were actually 63 percent your next game like indianapolis and the giants if you lost as an away favorite you've gone six and six and if you lost as an away dog it's been a negative you're only 14 and 21 40 percent so you see i have all the teams it applies to but kelly i have one super subset that i want to mention to you when you look at those teams that won as a home favorite in game one you see that they are 13 and 24 35 percent and that applies to 10 teams and those are listed on the bottom but if those teams that are in that subset are now in a way favorite up to minus seven that means they're a favorite of one two three four five six or six and a half those teams like the chargers the seahawks and the 49ers since 2016 have gone one and 13 against the spread that is 7.1 percent so again if they won as a home favorite in game one it's bad if they won as a home favorite now they're a short away favorite one in 13 is a pretty good number to look at if you want to fade the Chargers, the Seahawks, and the 49ers. I love that Ralph uh, puts the teams they apply to now, so now I just don't have to take notes. I can just take a screen grab, and I've got it at my disposal. So thank you, Ralph, for that one. Ralph, anything right now that you have to promote over at wagertalk.com? Well, I haven't loaded any NFL plays. I do have my first college football 5% play loaded. Yes, you can get all of Saturday for $39, but with the special we have, just amazing. 30 days of college football and the NFL combined for just $199. Think about it. College football and NFL for under $7 a day. That applies to my package or any of your favorite cappers at wagertalk.com. Well, Kelly, those were some interesting situations to fade looking at teams in game number two. Look at the two charts on to the right, both are involving teams playing division games only. The top chart on the right, you're playing a division game, you are playing game two, and both teams lost last week. This applies to the Giants in Washington and to the Rams in Arizona. Well, the total, the sides didn't say much, but take a look at the totals, guys. This is the top right. If you have a division game and both teams lost their season opener and you have a high total of 47 or more, like the Rams and Arizona, those teams have actually gone 8 and 280%. But I was expecting this lower number. When you have a team that both lost game one playing a division game in game two and a total of under 47, like the Giants in Washington, 13 overs, 31 unders. That is 70.5% to the under, and it makes perfect sense to me. You know your division folks well. You're both off a loss. You're both desperate for a win. You don't want to be 0-2 and 0-1 in the division. Conservative game plan. I do like that Giants-Washington game under, as the chart says. And Kelly, my final one is this. It doesn't get much cleaner than this. When you have red, 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 meaning a negative ATS number. If you ever hear, I really love this division foe. They are hungry. They have double revenge. They lost both games last year. Well, take a look to what teams have done if they have double revenge going into the next season. Home teams with double revenge, 40.6%. Home favorites like Miami and Washington with double revenge, 20 and 46%. 30.3%, home dogs 46.7, away favorites, no one applies this week, away dogs, no one applies. So only two teams apply to this chart, but this chart is good for the entire year. 
You want to fade a home favorite that has double revenge from losing to a division foe twice last year. That is a 70% fade, says to fade Miami and fade Washington. And they say you can't quantify revenge. In fact, Ralph is proving why you shouldn't. At Cal Sports LV, make sure you guys are giving him a follow. From the stat daddy to the prop prince, got to lose these glasses because it's time for Prop Shop with Andy Lang. Andy Lang, I owe you an apology for last week. I didn't realize I slipped a little in there. Who knows? Sometimes I just talk to talk. And uh, anyway, I digress. We're going to be friends again this week because it sounds like your prop is correlated to my barking dog. And that means we're both going to win, right? Absolutely, one hundred percent. Man, our best bet for the or for prop shop last week, Baker Mayfield over one and a half touchdown passes, couldn't have gone any better. So we're going to try and do another quarterback prop. Let's take a look at Will Levis. We're going to go under two hundred and a half yards passing. Obviously, he did not look very good last week. Only one hundred twenty-seven yards, thirty-two attempts, nineteen completions, had the killer interception. Uh, but there's a lot of other things going on just besides that stat line. The first is, I did not realize how injured DeAndre Hopkins was. Um, They have talked about that Hopkins has this MCL injury that he's apparently just going to have to play with for the entire year. This is not something that's going to heal up. One catch for eight yards last week. So we've got a big problem with DeAndre Hopkins. Calvin Ridley, he only had three catches. Only 6.7 yards per completion for Levis. And outside of those guys, it's just pretty thin at the skill position players. Um, The coach even said, Kelly, we could have punted every possession (laughs) in the second half. Can you not, please? Please, can you not? (laughs) I've already had to relive this. I even made a TikTok about it, Andy. I even made a TikTok about it. If it wasn't for Baker Mayfield in the Bucs game being right after, and the Bucs game was a breeze for me, laid four, thought when it hit three, I might be in a little bit of trouble. I might have just went off the deep end NFL week one. Well, it doesn't give you a lot of confidence that the coaching staff and the team has faith in Will Levis when they're saying we should just punt uh, instead of having you throw the ball. But here's the other thing. Uh, Let's take a look at the defense uh, that they're going to face here with the Jets. So this Jets defense, you know, last year they were set up with this elite secondary, but their defensive line had playmakers to put pressure on the quarterback, and then they had a good run stuffer. Except this year, they don't have these same guys. Hassan Reddick is not even playing. They they trade for him, and he's not even there. So what happens in week one? You can run the ball on the Jets, which completely disrupts their defense because they plan on their secondary being locked down, but they also plan on their defensive line being able to stop the run, which they could not. San Francisco, 38 attempts for 180 yards, 4.7 yards per run. So if I'm Tennessee and I've got a quarterback that I don't trust, I'm facing a defense that just gave up a lot of rushing yards. To me, the path of victory is running the ball and not letting Will Levis throw it. The other thing that we noticed is Aaron Rodgers was quoted as saying he's going to be running the play clock down to try and get used to this offense, to try and work out some of the kinks and to try and get a little bit more, a little bit more smooth with the plays. So We have Aaron Rodgers, who's probably going to run this play clock down, which is going to limit the amount of plays that we see in this game. And if the Jets get up, they're going to try and run the ball and bleed the clock out. And I'm just not a believer in this Tennessee team. I think this is a really good get-right spot for the Jets. I think they're going to win a close one. I like your barking dog at plus three and a half. But I think if this game is close, Tennessee is not going to let Will Levis throw the ball. And even if he does, I don't think he's going to have a lot of success because the path to victory for Tennessee is going to be running the ball. So I'm looking at Will Levis under 200 and a half passing yards for this week's bet on it. Best bet. And it also correlates with the under, which we'll talk about later on in the show. Andy Lang at Bump Sports over on Twitter. Andy, really quick, we got to give out your promo code before we let you go. Andy50 gets me... 50% off of week two plays. We already have a play locked and loaded for Thursday night football, and it's going to include all plays throughout Sunday and throughout Monday. We are up 151 units in all sports in 2024. Trying to reel in Tokyo, Brandon. The baseball god is just crushing it. I'm number two in units, Kelly. Trying to reel in Tokyo, Brandon, and grab that number one spot. So encourage everyone, no reason to not jump on these NFL plays. We were up 91 units last year. We're already up 151 units this year. Looking forward to adding some more profits to the bankroll. Promo code ANDY50. It's 50% off all of NFL Week 2 plays. 
wt.buzz backslash al. As I mentioned, check out all of Andy's free prop plays and any other free plays in the NFL, UFC, and golf over on the Wager Talk Instagram channel. Are you high? Is there a sandwich game? Because I'm really hungry. Teddy's segment, which I was supposed to read the comment section last week and figure out if we're going to call it just the tip or not. And of course, as Andy mentioned, my barking dog, some VR gold and best bets on the way. All right, right on schedule. I said I was hungry and I just checked my uh, script and Marco has a sandwich for us. Yeah, Kelly, and this is a big one. I hope you're hungry because this is a foot long uh, sandwich. Week two of the NFL and we got a perfect spot. Uh, I don't know if it could be any better than this. you got the 49ers coming off a short week, Monday night football, and now got to travel on the road and play in a dome. San Francisco, yeah, they looked about as good as they could look on Monday night football against the Jets as they went up and down the field on what was supposed to be a vaunted Jets defense. Uh, So coming off such a satisfying win, going out on the road on the short week, what do they got after Minnesota? Let me take a look. Oh, somebody named the L.A. Rams on deck. You know, you think sandwiched between the nationally televised Monday night game and the Rams on deck yeah, might just look a little bit past this Minnesota team. And let's also not forget Super Bowl loser. It's, you know, that jinx is real. And, you know, yeah, they look good on Monday night football. It was their home opener and it was Monday night. They're going to look good. Now, when you start to see that, uh, Super Bowl hangover for the loser, it starts in week two and moves out. And I think we're going to see a sluggish uh, game from them. And let's look at Minnesota. I know people are going to say they beat the Giants. So what? The Giants are pitiful. Well, you know what? I can't argue the fact that the Giants did look pitiful. But what I can also point out, you know what? Sam Darnold looked damn good on Sunday. And you don't get to say that very often with him. And you know what? It reminds me of another troubled quarterback that found his way on a team and inherited a starting job last year. Can you say Baker Mayfield? Sam Darnold has a chance to resurrect his career here in Minnesota, and I think this is a perfect spot for him to do it. And one other angle to throw in there, last week, we didn't find out till about 90 minutes before game time, but there was no Christian McCaffrey. That's another spark. How many times do we talk about the injured player theory, a team rallies when a star is out. Well, you know part two of that injured player theory. You take them in week one, you go against them in week two if they got the win. And if McCaffrey would happen to come back, it's another reason to go against them because it's the reverse effect on the player uh, injured player theory. I'm on Minnesota plus the points. One of these two teams is going to come out 2-0, and and I think it's just too easy for John Q. Public to look at this one and say, oh, man, San Francisco, I can tease them down to just win the game? Yeah, okay, go ahead, try that. I'm not. I'm taking Minnesota plus the points as my sandwich game of the week. And, Kelly, I'll make you happy. Let's call it Minnesota 24-23 so you can put that little sprinkle on there as well. Ooh, little outright underdog. Too bad I uh, revoked Marco's barking dog privileges because he wouldn't use big enough barking dogs. Now he's got to bring it in a different segment. I'm just teasing. (laughs) Joe, last week we were not high enough, and this Mm -hmm. week looks like you baked a little too much before the show. Yeah. (laughs) How high are you, and which game is too high? Well, it's, uh, I was definitely not high enough to kick it off, which was great because Washington and Tampa certainly uh, delivered uh, an easy over for us. Uh, this week, I'm going to piggyback off of what Teddy just talked about, and I'm going to head to that Philadelphia and Atlanta game, and I think that number is way too high. It's already starting to come down there. We did see it at 48 and a half. It is down to 47, and listen, I still think it's going to be uh, too high. I was impressed with Atlanta's defense. I think adding Matthew Judon, Justin Simmons to that defense with a defensive-minded head coach and Raheem Morris, uh, I like what we said. Teddy had mentioned it. They didn't give up a touchdown. Now, the problem is, uh, obviously, the offense here in Philadelphia is not with the offense of Pittsburgh is, but, uh, you know, you mentioned that slippery field. Saquon Barkley had a massive week there for Philadelphia. Don't know that the Falcons defense is going to allow him to get off like uh, like he did. 
Uh, something still not right with me with Jalen Hurts. Uh, still way too many turnover-prone plays uh, that can go either way in a game here. Uh, still trying to work out the kinks on both sides of the ball there for Philadelphia. And as far as Kirk Cousins goes, listen, uh, they ran everything out of a pistol formation. The problem is Kirk Cousins has run less than 10% of his total plays as an NFL quarterback out of the pistol. He struggled. Why? Doesn't look like he can he can really plant on that Achilles uh, foot yet. So I do think it's going to be a work in progress for him. I do think they have some weapons. Obviously, there is no way uh, that they want to get into any sort of shootout situation in this game against Philadelphia on the road. We already know where teams that have that extra day or more of rest, the under 108, 55 and one, that is 66% when teams, both teams are coming off more than eight days of rest there. And of course, the primetime unders we had mentioned since 2019 uh, just about 60%. When you put it all together, I don't see this thing flying. This is not going to be a high-scoring affair. I think the defenses come through here. Uh, and uh, like Teddy said, taking the points with Atlanta, if you're going to do that, you probably like the under, which is exactly what I do. Oh, boy. Those primetime unders have not been mm -hmm. kind to us to start this season. Maybe we see some early regression coming into this week. I, I don't know if I, I love this or not, uh, and I didn't listen to the comment section, but Andy Lang could not stop laughing at just the tip. And I was like, just for Andy alone, we have to keep just the tip, Teddy. And I'm never going to be able to say it with a straight face, just like promo code whatever69 that Johnny makes me read. But this is just the tip. Teddy covers. Give us a week two NFL stock tip. <laughs> Sure, this is about stock watch, and it's not necessarily for one week. It's moving forward. Let's call it a four or five week span. Last week I gave you the Chargers as a team that's ranked too high, and they won and covered. My opinion of LA didn't necessarily change for that ball game, and I'm going to talk here about a team that won and covered last week. But I'm going to buy them here. That team, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and this is a scenario. Doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. That's why I wanted to bring it up in this space. The public is ahead of the wise guys on Tampa Bay. The wise guys looked at Tampa as a very mediocre team last year. They didn't make any splashy moves in free agency. They were lined seven and a half, eight wins coming into the season. They were not the favorites to win the division, despite the fact they've been the best team in the division for the better part of the last five years. There is wise guy disrespect for Tampa Bay. And I don't think that changed after week number one. And look, this may not be the best week to bet Tampa because they do have some cluster injuries in the secondary. And that is absolutely a concern for me in this matchup against Detroit this week. They have depth concerns. They may not be a great team once December rolls around. But this offense right now is capable of trading points with anyone. They scored on seven of eight meaningful possessions last week. I get that Washington's D is no good, but it's still impressive. It's not like the Lions' D is elite. All right. This team finished five and one last year. They re-signed nearly every key free agent. They're running it back with a good team. You look at their receiving core. Are Chris Godwin and Mike Evans the most underrated duo in the NFL and the wide receiver position? Baker Mayfield's good right now. You know, not okay, not mediocre. He's good. He was good last year down the stretch. He's good right now. And the wise guys aren't there yet. So I think there's money to be made with the Tampa Bay Bucks moving forward. For the next month or so, I'll be looking at Tampa Bay every week. Yeah, I can kind of see that. I was on Tampa Bay last week, Teddy. We'll see, especially at home, keep an eye on those Buccaneers. And uh, my underdog is not a big underdog at this point, down to three and a half. Andy kind of already alluded to it. And I'm kind of disgusted with myself that I, I didn't try to make a case for maybe Green Bay or Cincinnati. But I'm going to make a case for those Tennessee Titans. Yeah, that that same team, you guys remember. 17-0 lead. And then, uh, let's see, I think it was a fumble, an interception, and a pick six. Yeah, that was really fun. Uh, historically, bad beat. Chicago somehow got the win despite they had the fewest yards in a win by any team since 2020. The Jets, by all means, last four games, 4-0 four against the Titans. I understand that Will Levis, well, he looked absolutely atrocious in that fourth quarter. But this is a Jets team 
coming off a short week, Monday night football, nothing impressive versus that defense there in San Francisco. Tennessee's defense, on the other hand, does have that ability. I think they're getting a we're getting a buy low spot here, and it's really low, almost well too low. It makes me sick to my stomach to think I'm going to do it. I tweeted it the other day. And I owe all of you guys an apology. This is uglier than all the ones I just made fun of Marco about. Hold your nose, close your eyes, and press that button on your prospective sportsbook app. And we'll see you guys on Sunday. All right, we're going to kick it over to VR. Yep, that's right. The Leprechaun is back with some gold. What up, VR? Week one now in the books. What the heck did we learn last week? Besides, well, the fact that I cannot trust Will Levis. Kelly, here's what we learned last week, that the NFL market is extremely efficient and one of the toughest to beat. Because if you take a step back, this is what the results were. Favorites go nine and seven, close to 50-50 when you factor in the VIG. One game over 500 with that. Overs, unders, nine and seven, same exact thing, close to 50-50. That's as as efficient of a market as you're going to get. In fact, if you step back even further, and look over the last 5,000 games, you're going to come very close to 2,500 favorites, 2,500 dogs, 2,500 overs, 2,500 unders. And the reason's simple, because it's almost impossible to balance the money 50-50. So if you could balance the result, you're guaranteed that same hold. And they're very good at balancing the result because they're able to shade towards so many better biases. And we're seeing that already in week two. So that's what I learned in week one, that nothing's changed. The Whether the players go to free agency, whether head coaches move around, no matter what happens, the NFL market is very efficient and more times than not ahead of the better. So you have to be very selective. You can't take bad numbers. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it from my side. Don't take bad numbers. We know this, guys. This is Sports Betting 101. Uh, VR, give me some NFL Week 2 gold. What have you seen come across your desk on Wednesday morning? I'm going to give this warning out a little bit of caution because the week two is overreaction week. And a lot of the guys that I work with and guys I share with work a lot of middles and they know they could get out ahead of the market early and take advantage of some of these recency biases. So be cautious in drawing conclusions early in the week unless you're strong on that side and maybe wait and monitor the line a little bit. Let's start off with Raiders Ravens a perfect example, under 43. And why? Raiders score, what, 10 points in week one? Um, And then Ravens only put up 20 themselves. And then you look at the second play, Chargers minus four. You look at the recency bias there. How bad could Carolina look? Of course, you're going to get Charger money from the betting public. So if they could lay four and a half and this gets up to six, rest assured, they will be buying back on the Panther side or six and a half, or who knows, maybe even seven. But that's how the betting syndicates approach, especially early on, especially week two. Saints Cowboys over 44 and a half, over 45. There's recency bias again. How good did the Saints offense look? How good did the Cowboys offense look? So there's a lot of recency bias that the betting syndicates will look to take advantage of. Um, Another big uh, a change we saw in the Colts Packers. Dude, the look ahead was 47 on the total. It's down to 41. And if you factor in the changing quarterback, it's like the, the market charged over a touchdown. That's an overreaction at best. I do expect to see the sharp betters go against that. And that's usually what happens. If they don't get ahead of the injury, they usually take advantage by con- going contradictory to the injury as if back in that, that side thinking it's being overvalued or undervalued if it's the opposite way. Then Browns Jaguars laid the three on Jaguars at minus 110 and under 44 and a half, under 44. Drop down the Seahawks minus three, also under 41, under 40 and a half. Finally, Giants Commanders over 42. A little surprising when you look at the series. Five of the last six have gone under Uh, But both defenses looked so bad. Wasn't surprised to see that over steam early in the week. Cardinals against the Rams. Cardinals at plus two. I see it. But then laid the money line. This is a team that's lost eight of ten in the series against the Rams. And both of them come off six-point losses as dogs last week. 
So taking that Arizona as home dogs, that's what the Sharps did. And then uh, the Bengals, ton of injuries on that side. That's why you see the adjustment. It's not a sharp move on the KC team. It was minus three and a half. Look ahead, up to five and a half. If anything, I saw some plus six being grabbed when it was out there on the Bengals. So be careful there. But the over is legit, over 46 and a half, over 47 in Bengals. Chief, uh, finally, under Steelers Broncos, 40, 39 and a half. And, and then again, when they adjusted two points, hit under 37 and a half. It's got to be an over adjustment by this point, right? Three points in the NFL seems like a lot to me. Finally, Monday Night Football, Eagles minus six and a half. This cautions right now. Here's why. The, they added juice to the six and a half, Kelly. I could tell you with certainty that I bet it for one of the groups that I move for. And then one of the traders that I, uh, movers that I share stuff with, his group bet it too. And it's still six and a half, just juice, not seven. I'm thinking, why is that? Why is that? But if you look where the opener was, the look ahead, it was four and a half. So anyone that got down at four and a half, if they go to seven, that's a huge, huge middle um, even with the total up where it is. So I think they're going to try to hold off going to seven for as long as they can. But I think that Eagles money, especially if there's a lot of teasers tied into it, they're going to be forced to get the seven on the Eagles. And then where you got to pay attention, are they grabbing the Falcons at the plus seven mark? If they're not, Eagles are definitely the side. Do you guys like this gold? I love it. I'm over here taking notes. I also take notes every Saturday and Sunday with VR when he joins us for Last Call, our live show, bringing all of the gold, usually around uh, 11, 15 Eastern, 8, 15 Pacific on Saturdays, and of course, 12, 15 Eastern, 9, 15 Pacific on Sundays. VR, we thank you as always. Good thank luck you, this Cal. week. Do some damage. All right, guys, now... It is time to do some damage because we've got our best bets coming up. All right, it is time for best bets. Last week, I cashed my best bet and I should have probably looked to see how everybody else did, but I digress. Marco D'Angelo, your best bet this week. Ooh. Well, Kelly, we, we pushed mine last week, but uh, it was an ugly push because Denver come in the back door uh, for the push against Seattle. But we're going to go again this week. And, Kelly, you made fun of me about having a dog in the other segment for the sandwich. You took the dogs away from me. I, I like dogs, okay? I'm an animal lover. I'm coming back with another one here for you in best bets. And this one might be a little tough to swallow as well. Because even though both teams are coming off blowout wins, I think public perception comes away with one of these teams looking much better than the other one. And I'm talking about the Dallas-New Orleans game. New Orleans just steamrolled uh, Carolina, all right? And that was an ugly one. I'll, full disclosure, I was on Carolina in that game. I went 4-1 and one in the Westgate last week. And yeah, Carolina was the one loser for me there. But... They can't help who they played. They played well. Offensively, they did everything well. I'm looking at Dallas, and I just think that the hype with Dallas right now coming off the Cleveland game is just too much. I think this line is too high. And I would sit and wait because if we lose the six and a half and it goes to six, which I don't think it will, it's worth the risk of waiting to see if we get to the seven, which I think could happen. When the public gets involved on Sunday, they're going to want – Dallas. Dallas is going to be in all kinds of money line parlays. They're going to be laying the points with them, and everybody will be looking to tease them down just to win at home. I'm not going to do it. Um, you also have the fact that Dallas last week got that little spark, or at least one of their players got that little spark spark whenever they opened the cash register for Dak Prescott they announced it Sunday morning that he got the new contract and uh highest paid uh, quarterback so yeah everything fell into place for Dallas they looked good against the team that a lot of people thought was a Super Bowl contender this year I'm not going to overreact to one game but my god Deshaun Watson, at what point for the Cleveland Browns do you start to earn a, the paycheck that you are getting? I'm going to take New Orleans here. I think they stay in this game. Dallas at home, I know they've put up big numbers in the past, but I still don't trust Dallas laying points. I'm not sold on that defense. Cleveland just couldn't do anything. It was more of the Cleveland beating themselves than Dallas shutting them down. 
I think the Saints stay in this one. I'm going to go all the way to the end. It's decided by a field goal late. Do we want to put a sprinkle? How about an upset? New Orleans, 23-20. Who would have thunk New Orleans be one of the 2-0 and teams after week two? I'm going for it. My best bet. Mark, mm. Absolutely, Marco. I'm with you in that one. Uh, I'm actually concerned about starting Dak Prescott in my fantasy team, in fact, because that Saints defense – I'm not sure if they looked that good or if it was the Carolina Panthers looking that bad. Another six-point underdog, Joe Ranieri. The Cincinnati Bengals, how healthy is Joe Burrow? Are we going to see Jamar Chase? Yeah, uh, well, we probably we might see Higgins. We'll probably see some combination of those two, but we're, we're also going to see is a whole lot of talk this week about, oh, God, the sky is falling. Cincinnati <laughs> blows. Oh, God, they're terrible. They're not going to be any good. Like, all right, everyone settle down here for just a minute here. Yes, I watched, unfortunately, that Bengals and Patriots game, and they didn't have a whole lot going right, including losing two fumbles in that game. Uh, one of them happened to be uh, in the uh, near the end zone there. They were about to roll into the end zone, in fact, uh, when Burrow threw an interception there, they also failed to convert on a fourth and two right around New England's 30-yard line. So they look to me like a team where Joe Burrow was a little rusty, the timing wasn't there, and it was not uh, it was not a great spot. But they were no way, shape, or form blown out by New England in this spot here. So what we have, I think, is a wonderful buy low spot and sell high here with Kansas City because uh, the argument can be made there if it wasn't for the old toe tap there or half a toenail uh, or if the fact that he doesn't throw behind Zay Flowers to play prior to that, we're having a different conversation about the Chiefs here. Uh, this number is just way too high. It was six and a half. I'm starting to see sixes now. Same thing I felt about Arizona last week and our best bet there against Buffalo, which came through. Same situation here. I will buy Joe Burrow in this spot any day. 17 and 8 against the number as an underdog. 15 and 2 against the number as a dog of three or more points in the NFL. There is no reason for anybody to be selling Cincinnati stock just yet. I get it. The Chiefs and Mahomes, they'll have Marquise Brown, yes, but I also love what they did in the secondary or uh, adding Geno Stone, Von Bell back into Cincinnati, and Lou Anarumo, one of my favorite defensive coordinators. Burrow has had his way and success against Mahomes in this spot. He's also had too much success to ignore here, getting six points on the road against uh, Kansas City. I'm buying low. I'm selling high on Kansas City. Give me the Bengals plus the points. Don't blame me on that one. They could not have looked worse last week than mm. against the Patriots. Might be time to play on those Bengals. Teddy, this is an interesting one. I don't know how I feel about it. The Colts last week could not get it done for me. They had so many tries. They were <laughs> so frustrating against the Texans. I did have plus two and a half in addition to the money line. So not all was lost. Talk to me about what you saw in the Colts and Anthony Richardson last week that you like and want to lay three with them this week. Well, there's more to dislike about Green Bay. And that to me is the key piece of this handicap. But certainly from the pro Indy side, look, we know this team has big playability. We saw it on full display last week. And I'm very interested in teams that can score quick strike touchdowns. That matters to me. That matters to me in college. It matters to me in the NFL. The betting markets tend to underreact to teams that aren't putting together these long drives. And the quick strike TDs, they're very meaningful in my handicap. And Andy's a team that's capable of scoring them. Now, they didn't run the football all that well last week. Jonathan Taylor just 16 of 48, a long carry of seven yards. However, this week they're facing a Green Bay defense that got absolutely gashed on the ground against Philly. And that's been a problem for Green Bay before that. Now, this is a pass defense for the Packers. That is a problem on paper heading into the season, and it lived up to expectations last week. So you have a new defense coordinator in Jeff Halfley. You're coming off a game in Brazil. All right, so you have an awkward travel spot. You have a run D that's exploitable, and you have a pass D that's exploitable. That's the Green Bay side of the equation. And here's the kicker. 
obviously Jordan Love's sideline. Jordan Love, 37 touchdowns, 13 interceptions last year. He was a Pro Bowl caliber quarterback. I don't remember if he made it or not, but it doesn't matter. He was that good. We're going from Jordan Love to Malik Willis. I've watched Malik Willis a bunch, all right, from his time at Liberty into the NFL. Now he's starting in Green Bay. He's been there less than three weeks. He was a late training camp addition. He wasn't even there for the start of training camp. Now he's a starting quarterback. In Malik Willis's career, 52% completions, zero touchdowns, three interceptions. That's on 67 pass attempts. Oh, by the way, 67 pass attempts, 15 sacks. Your classic young QB holding the ball too long, not throwing downfield, making mistakes. He's been in offense less than three weeks. And, oh, here's his quote. Well, it's like transferring schools. It's NFL football, but it's different terminology in a different system. Good luck with that, kid. I even back, back to college, all right? At college, Willis, at Liberty, his senior year, with a one-step-up game, Ole Miss, no touchdowns, three interceptions. The junior year, NC State, threw three picks in that game as well. Yeah, I'll lay three here. I think Green Bay's bet against. Teddy does not mm. think that the drop-off between Jordan Love and Malik Willis is big enough. He's laying three with Indianapolis. Real quick promo before we get to my best bet. Four weeks of college football and NFL under 50 bucks a week. You get 30 days college football and NFL for $199. That saves you over 20%. This gives you access for 30 days to college football and NFL from your favorite handicapper. But with an all-access package, you get the selections immediately when they are loaded. That means throughout the week, so, of course, you can get the best line value, 30 days of football for just under 7 bucks a day. Now we're going to pivot to my best bet. And, uh, God, I can't believe this is my best bet. It's week two. College football was slim pickings. NFL is slim pickings. But we're going to go with the Denver Broncos plus three here. A, Russell Wilson, will he be healthy enough to get his revenge on Sean Payton? We don't know. As of right now, he is questionable at uh, – 3 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday. If he's not, we, mm, we're we going to just go ahead and say that there's not much of a drop-off between Justin Fields and himself. So I don't think we see much of a line move. I will give Justin Fields the nod to being a more mobile quarterback. But what did we see last week? We saw this Denver defense absolutely step up, put a ton of pressure on Geno Smith, including two safeties. I'm not going to say anything great about Bo Nix, but he did have a couple of exciting moments. He had that four-yard rushing touchdown, and, well, as the lowly Broncos fan here, I can tell you that uh, he's the first Bronco quarterback since Jake Plummer to start a se uh, season off with uh, no touchdowns and two interceptions. That being said, we will see if Denver can keep it close at home in mile high because this is really more of a play against the Steelers' W last week. They kicked their way into a win over Atlanta by controlling the time of the clock by over 11 minutes. They did not score a single touchdown. Congrats to Chris Boswell getting his uh, fantasy owners into some sort of victory because three of them were over 50 yards. Marco D'Angelo was secretly smiling about that one. I think this is going to be an ugly, terrible disgusting low scoring game in Denver. Ooh. Let's call it 17 14 final. Give me the Broncos plus the three. That's all I got. Sorry guys. NFL with a bunch of gross picks. I feel so nasty. I gotta go take a shower, but instead we've got to film the college edition <laughs> of bet on it next. So make sure you guys check that out on the wager talk YouTube channel as well. From Marco, Joe, Teddy, Ralph, Andy, VR, and myself, and of course our producer, Dan, waiting in the wings. We adore you guys. Smash that like button. Hit subscribe so you never miss another episode of Bet On It. Till next week, let's bet on it.